to a societal benefit. Now, the cost is high. The benefit, you know, might be, is still high, I would say. You know, I've seen, going through Atlanta Airport, the way people treat soldiers, which, again, I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm just saying they do get a benefit from that. But the cost is much higher. Unsurprisingly, the cost-benefit part of our brain, which is not even conscious, says, you know what? I think it would be better for me to try to find a job that doesn't involve people shooting at me, because right now, it's hard to get into the military without getting shot at. And so, you know, that's something where, the, as the cost-benefit ratio changes, human behavior changes with it just the way you predict it would if it was happening the same way any other animal does. And so, why might this, this behavior, we've got where we can expand our group to a larger group. And like I said, this probably started out as kin selection. You were in a small group. If you sacrificed yourself, you were helping relatives. You also had the benefit that you were probably in a stable group where you knew everyone, and it was easy to punish those individuals who cheated and to recognize those individuals who didn't belong. Again, going back to things like the Amish, where they have very specific dress that separates them from everyone else. They're defining their group very clearly. And so this was probably where altruism came from, was kin selection that just kind of expanded the grouping to include new individuals. And one of the other characteristics of both humans and all animals and evolution in general is the problem of short-term thinking, which is just that we don't plan for the future very well. And the reason we don't is because we have not evolved to do that. No animal has, because evolution doesn't plan for the future. Evolution says if it works today, that's all I care about. I can't plan for what's going to work in 100 years. If it doesn't work today, that's all that matters. It might be great if you could change something today that would then give you a benefit in 100 years, but that's not how evolution is going to work. It has to work today if it's going to pass on to the next generation. And this leads to all sorts of problems. Stock market investors. Oh, you've got to make a profit in six months off of this stock or I'm going to sell it. You know, that sort of thing that comes up with the issues of investing, where they always say it's for the long haul. They always say that on the money show. It's for the long haul. But these are the guys who say, sell, buy, sell, buy. That's, that's short-term thinking, which causes all sorts of problems. Uh, the shareholders in the company, you have to show me a profit every year. You can't, you know, lose money this year and make money next year. It's got to make money this year or I'm going to sell it or I'm going to fire the board of directors or whatever. Again, short-term thinking is what we do. Professional athletes and steroids. I can't believe Congress is actually involved in this crap, but uh, having all these guys up there, I mean, they're taking all these drugs and they say, oh, it won't have any big effect on you and whatever, and we know it will. We know it will. We know that these drugs have long-term impacts, but convincing someone to think about what will happen when they're 18, what's going to happen when they're 40 is incredibly difficult. With 18-year-olds, we can't even think to when they're 20 happens. So long-term thinking, you know, we'll harm ourselves in the short term for a benefit like more home runs, but maybe damaging our bodies with cancer and all sorts of other problems that will come later. And our general societal response to long-term problems, global warming, environmental change, you know, whatever way you think about this, you know, whether you think we're causing it or not, the simple fact of the matter is I'm very pessimistic we'll ever do anything about it because we won't respond until it's a disaster. That's how we do things. When it's a disaster, right now, we have to make a change. That's when we make the change. As opposed to, you know, 73, 74 with the oil embargo and all the problems that came with that, where maybe we should start thinking about alternatives to oil in the first place. Now, once the crisis was over, we went back to the big cars with the fins. And, you know, now we're up to $3 a gallon again, and people are griping about it as they drive their Humvees from one gas station to the next because you can't drive more than three miles without getting gas. <laughs> Um, they, get, they get upset, but that's, again, short-term thinking. Not that we should all get hybrids, we should, that's not going to work either. But the point is that we don't think for solutions until the disaster is upon us, at which case it's oftentimes too late to do anything about it. Which, again, if you, if you think long-term, here's the problem. I'm not going to do something because it will wreck the environment in 100 years. The guy next to you does something that wrecks the environment that then benefits that person, enriches him or gives him whatever, then he now will pass on the trait of destroying the environment to his kids, and that person will oftentimes have more kids than you do, so the next generation will end up being full of kids who don't behave appropriately. So if you forbear the behavior, unless everybody else forbears the behavior, it doesn't do any good, because the next generation will be full of people who didn't do the behavior that you told them, or who are still doing the behavior that you tried to stop. This is why there was, there was an idea at one point of, we'll stop population growth, by putting people on a spaceship and sending them to another planet. The problem is, to get them on a spaceship, you have to pick all the people who won't have kids because they can't overpopulate the spaceship, right? So you say, okay, you, 
you line the people up and say, all right, well, you be one, only have one kid so that you don't overpopulate the spaceship. Yes? Okay, get on. No? Oh, sorry, i got to stay here. All you do is end up with a planet full of people who won't stop having kids, which would just make the population problem actually worse than it currently is. Which also, um, I don't think I saw Idiocracy by Mike Judge. Yes. He, at the very beginning, talks about this. You know, you've got the couple with the high IQs who never have any kids, and the redneck guy who's having sex with everybody, Jerry Springer style, and they show his family tree you know, popping up constantly with new kids. It's the same problem, that people, unless everyone does it, changing the behavior isn't going to work long term. And that's the problem, too. We, can't all, we never can get everybody to do it, and that's the problem. There's always someone who's willing to, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. You can't tell me what to do, which is you know, nice and all, but unfortunately, the long-term effects are bad. And I think this is, about, I think this is the last slide. Uh, eugenics was the idea that we could control our evolution and get rid of undesirable traits, things that we don't like. Usually, the, this, this term goes back, we think, think of the Nazis, but this actually goes back to a British uh, guy around the early 1900s who thought of this. The Nazis took it to extremes. But it's an idea that's been around for a while, and it still is today with, we call it genetically engineering our offspring, which it sounds better, I guess. It sounds more cool and spacey and whatnot. But the basic idea is, can we control what's going on in our evolutionary history? I personally would argue that we can't, because it's never worked in the past. You know, we try to breed plants to be a certain way, and things all it can't happen. I don't care how much people say, oh yeah, in the future we'll all be genetically engineered to be smart and healthy. And what it, no, we won't. It's not physically possible to do so. It's just not. Um, and like I said, the idea of unintended consequences is really important here. The idea that we have all of these plants where we grow an entire field where they're all genetically identical, so they all are strong and healthy is great, until the next virus comes in that can attack those strong and healthy plants and wipe them out. A monoculture is a bad idea. Variability is what keeps you safe from disasters. And anything that we do that eliminates variability is in the long term probably going to cause problems. Sickle cell anemia is a byproduct of a trait that protects you against malaria. Cystic fibrosis is a byproduct of a trait that protects you from typhoid fever. These diseases are spreading and they're still present in certain parts of the world that if we eliminate the resistances to them, we're just damaging our own population. Who knows what the world's going to be like in 100 years? Maybe malaria will be in Georgia that having the sickle cell trait will be a benefit because most of our drugs don't work on malaria anymore in certain parts of the world. So, you know, eliminating that gene will get rid of sickle cell anemia, theoretically. But it also means we're now vulnerable to a disease that we currently have at least some level of protection against. And so the unintended consequences, I think, of that are quite severe. So, the future of human evolution, you some, I get this question a lot, are humans still evolving? I don't know why this question comes up. I think this is partly based on like things like Discovery Channel and things. We'll run documentaries called The End of Evolution and things like that. Human beings are always going to evolve. Evolution just means you change in response to your environment. Our environment is going to change, therefore we are going to change with it. That's, that's a fact of nature. If we ever stop changing, the environment will change and leave us behind and we'll be dead. So we don't want to stop evolving. Can we stop evolution? No. We can't stop evolution of anything. The HIV, we thought we were going to wipe that out with AZT. That worked for about two months, and then it had evolved resistance to AZT to the point where AZT by itself is now useless. It's used in the drug cocktails because if you give six or eight different drugs to a person, AZT does some good. But those drug cocktails are expensive, they're hard to give, and they have all sorts of horrible side effects. So it's not really um, something we're going to be able to stop. Oh, I guess that's it. So, any questions before we go on through? I couldn't find the mug. I don't know where the mug is. It's not in the glass cabinet anymore. But somewhere we have a mug for the most involved member of the HGA, so the quiz will be <laughs> your chance to see if you can earn the mug. You talked about territoriality uh, and you have the, the similarities between humans uh, and animals. But, uh, and I don't know if, if animals exhibit this trait or not, but I know within humans, territoriality is uh, dependent on the, on the supply of food in the area. For example, I studied anthropology 